And thank you all very much for coming here this evening, taking time out to, uh, to come to this discussion organized by uh, our own uh, friend and a very keen observer of uh, what is happening in the political scene in Pakistan, Shayan Abdul Khan. Uh, and thank you very much, Poppy, for giving us this opportunity to get together and take stock of what is happening in Pakistan's uh, politics and uh, what is happening to the nascent democratic order. Uh, we are living in a post-martial law period, that's how some of us view it. Uh, so just take stock of the situation that has emerged just recently in the past few weeks. Um, and uh, we all know that there's been, a, there's been a long history of strained civil military relations in Pakistan. Uh, we thought it was opportune, particularly today is the 16th of December. Uh, and uh, 40 years ago today, uh, General A.A.K. Niazi surrendered in Dhaka and a new nation state out of uh, the womb of uh, the Pakistani state that was formed in 1947 was born. So it is actually uh, quite relevant to look at the civil-military relations afresh and to have that conversation. We have some of the most eminent uh, authors, speakers, and, uh, uh, and people who actually uh, believe in democracy. They may not necessarily uh, be a part of any political party uh, themselves. Uh, they are independent observers, but they, they may also be um, members of uh, different student parties or, or political parties. Um, but one thing is common, that uh, there is a segment within the civil society and within the, uh, the scholars or, or, or the commentators in Pakistan who have a certain view. Uh, so uh, somebody was saying just before the beginning of this program, this panel looks a little lopsided. It is not a little lopsided, it is a lopsided panel, I'm afraid. Uh, but we have people, I can see people in the audience who can uh, challenge what is being said or what will be said from the panel this evening. So I request my speakers to make the initial comments. They will get opportunities to respond to questions and uh, further clarify certain points that there is. But uh, initially, I would request them to stick to five to seven minutes uh, to make their observations. I start with uh, Mr. Ashraf Kakar. Uh, it's very difficult to start. <laughs> but anyway, I had a chance to uh, look at a job youth policy like two weeks ago, uh, the second of drop of uh, job youth policy. Interestingly, it was like a 14 page document. And there was not a single word uh, democracy in that document. So, it will tell you like, what's going on with democracy in our country. So, I don't have any like particular narrative uh, about democracy or something, but I, I will just comment on like what's going on on four or five news I can just um, last week. So, what, one was that Punjabi policy don't have, in the second drop, they don't have the word democracy. Forget about democratic value. So it was all about moral, morality, Islamic values. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Islamic values. But you know, what is Islamic values do we have that? So, I mean, <coughs> uh, the second thing, there was like, after this NATO attack uh, on this Malaka thing, uh, And at the same time, after like that attack, okay, there is an operation going on in our state agency. Uh, after 15 days, after that, in 15 days, there were 300 militants, <coughs> so-called militants, killed, and it was reported in newspaper just in, in one line in two minutes. 300 militants were killed, and there was nothing in the media and civil society who was these militants. Who killed them? What were they doing? There was no response in our own media about these things. Who these militants are? And I also want to talk about Balochistan today as an example of 
uh, perhaps the most pertinent example of lopsided military civil relations in Pakistan, and especially considering the fact that it's 16 December, I think um, it warrants a look at what is going on in Balochistan and if, is it another Bangladesh in the making. And this is kind of on the side, but I was, while we were, I, everyone was waiting um, for people to gather, I just picked up this newspaper and the first thing I saw, I'm just going to read out a very small part of it, but I mean, I was amazed by the fact that it was the first thing I saw. Uh, this is Akbar Jahan, and this is a piece which is titled Bayan Bazi. And it starts, Baluchistan National Party ke senior naib sadar Senator Hasil Bizinjo ne kaha hai ke Baluchistan mein hukumat naam ki koi cheez nahi. Inhone ye bayan dekar baaki subon ke awam ko ehsaas e mehroomi mein mubtala kar diya. Inke bayan se kuch aisa taasur milta hai jaise sirf Baluchistan mein hukumat naam ki koi cheez nahi hai, baaki tamam subon mein hukumat hi hukumat hai. Lagta hai Hasil Bizinjo sahab akhbarat nahi padte aur shayad TV चैनल्स भी ज्यादा तवज्जो से नहीं देखते वरना पूरे मुल्क में जो कुछ हो रहा है उसे देखने के बाद भी अगर उन्हें कहीं हुकूमत का सुराग मिल जाता तो फिर उन्हें एनएस का नंबर चेक कराने का मशवरा दिया जाता बिजेंद्र साहब एक सियासी पार्टी के उद्देदार भी हैं सेनेटर भी हैं और पुराने सियासतदान भी कम से कम इन्हें तो मालूम होना चाहिए कि हमारे मुल्क में हुकूमत सदर वजीर-ए-आजम और दीगर वजरा के साथ इन्हीं के घरों में रहती वो घर से निकलते हैं तो हुकूमत भी इनके साथ निकल पड़ती है वगैरह 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 और इट बेसिकली एंड्स बाय सेइंग कि भाई अगर ये लोग गली कुछ में जाते तो इनको पता होता कि यहां पर हुकूमत है यू नो द प्रोटेक्शन कोट एंड कोट ऑफ स्ट्रेटजिक लोकेशंस ऑफ नेचुरल रिसोर्सेज एंड द फैक्ट दैट इट इज द मिलिट्री एक्चुअली हु इज कोऑप्टिंग एंड हु हैज बेसिकली the ability and the power to negotiate with various sadars. You know that this is a tribal setup. I mean, it's um, it's fragmented. It's the social organization <coughs> continues to be tribal. And instead of handing over authority to the civilian government and to uh, others who would have the ability to negotiate various deals on which have impacts on um, on natural resource extraction projects, on control over quote unquote strategic locations, over policing the borders. The military does not want to hand over uh, the ability and the power to be able to negotiate with the people there to uh, a civilian government. Um, and I mean, there's. I mean, I just want to because I know I only have five to seven minutes, but um, you know the consequences of military dominance in Balochistan um, and the fact that there has been, you know, virtually nothing other than a puppet government there ever has had some very serious consequences, which we're beginning to see now. Um, there's a huge amount of disillusionment with the political process. Uh, not just uh, the fact that, I mean, and this is also compounded by the fact that even elections are such a heavily manipulated affair. Um, you know, it's, it's just become a joke, really. Uh, elections, it's just a joke. It's already sort of predetermined, etc. cetera. Um, so, you also see a movement, I mean, the, the Baloch national movement has, is a very old phenomenon. It started off in 1948, but the trends that are emerging within the movement now uh, as, a as a consequence of repeated disillusionments with democracy and with civilian rule have led to um, a much more cohesive and a much more radical and a much more xenophobic movement uh, in Balochistan. And part of the reason for that xenophobia is that Punjabis, are the uh, dominant class uh, in the army especially, all the entire officer class is Punjabi. The foot soldiers are not Punjabi, the officers are Punjabi, they live in the cantonments, they don't get target killed. Uh, they're not the ones at risk. Um, it is the Pashtun soldiers, so what they do is they use the FC, which is the frontier constabulary, the frontier constabulary much of which is actually staffed uh, local, <coughs> on the foot soldier level by Pashtuns. <coughs> Right? And Pakhtuns, as you know, uh, comprise a huge percentage of the population of Balochistan. So they're using the military option very successfully, not just to actually kill off Baloch activists, but to heighten Baloch Pashtun um, tensions within the province, and so therefore just create another divide and rule kind of. Um, I will, I will wind up. Um, and yeah, lastly, um, you know, I think that. Uh, Plus, the fact that Balochistan has been the site of nuclear testing, they cannot do that in Punjab. 
They cannot do that in Sin. They cannot do that anywhere where there will be um, a representation of people, anything other than just a mere puppet government. And, um, you know, on the one hand, we see this tension that is emerging now. As he said, you know, there's national democracy coming up. And it is, you know, despite the fact that on the ground it has meant virtually nothing to the people of Balochistan, especially to the Baloch, uh, that there is now uh, the 18th Amendment and the Balochistan package. But on the other hand, what is, it does signal is an important division and in interest between the civilian rulers of this country and the military uh, leadership. Because the military establishment wants, cannot afford provincial autonomy because it will lose out all of these abilities uh, and all the powers it has now. On the other hand, the civilian government is now being forced into a position where it has to co-opt the local elite in order to have a functioning democracy, which is in the interest of the civilian leadership. And that's where I'm going to leave it because I have no more time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.